Greenlight Network presents Football Time. Hey, and welcome to the Football Time Show. We're here to get into our NFL Week 3 recap and review with our man Achilles Rain. I know he's pumped up after a big Week 3 for his Rams. We got a bunch of other games to get into along with that big one. So are you ready to get into the Week 3 games? Oh, yeah, man. Week 3 was a lot better than I thought it was going to be. It's exciting, and I'm ready to recap some of these games. All right. Well, in our mutual picks, we went two and three on the week. That brings us to seven and eight on the year so far. So uh, two, two and three weeks after a nice three and two weeks to start the thing. So a little bit off. Uh, Your love of the Giants has really cost us some issues here. But uh, nonetheless, we'll move on and we'll go with our win. The Baltimore Ravens versus the Detroit Lions. We had the first half minus four. And guess what? We guessed right. Uh, The Ravens played a good first half. The Detroit Lions played a good second half. They have been a team of halves. A bad first half in their opening game. Great second half versus the Niners. First, the Green Bay Packers, the Detroit Lions. Played a big, great first half, a bad second half, and in this one, uh, they did not play a great first half. Uh, I, the Ravens would have gotten a much bigger lead if uh, Marquise Brown had caught two touchdown passes that he literally dropped. Uh, but anyway, Lions made their way back and were really, really unlucky to sort of lose this game. There was a delay a game penalty that didn't get called, and then the uh, The record of field goal uh, gets made on them. Uh, A 66-yard kick by Justin Tucker in this one to uh, win them the game overall. So uh, what do you make here of the this Baltimore Ravens team? This was really a a bad second half. I didn't think Lamar looked great uh, in this game, but he did make the play to get him down there on that fourth and 19. But uh, overall, difficult game for the Ravens. Yeah, I mean, although – we consider Baltimore to be a really good team. I think we might be overestimating their talent level at this point. I know it's early in the season, but, you know, we've seen them come short a few times. Uh, They just seem to play up to their opponent, it seems like. Uh, On the other side of the ball, I do want to say that Detroit, even though they impressed me the first couple of weeks, I feel like this was their most complete game. I know it was very low scoring, but it was also the first time that they held the team below 20 points. Uh, So, I think there's a lot of upside for both teams, but ultimately I think the uh, the big uh, star of the show here is uh, Tucker with that record set and field goal to win the game. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, uh, the Ravens were missing a handful of guys in this game, so I think you've got to factor that in a little bit. But I do think it's a little bit disappointing here when you watch this game. The Ravens have always been sort of able to beat up on low-level teams and to really need that push uh, there at the end. And, you know, they, they get credit for the win in that column. But, you know, they, they were a little bit lucky uh, to get this win, uh, especially if you take that delay a game, you call that delay a game. Uh Tucker wasn't making a 71-yard field goal by the judge of that 66-yard field goal. Oh, that that, thing barely got in there. That just rolled in there. But uh, anyway, it's hard for me to judge this Baltimore team. I I thought they played a pretty good game, and they deserved to win that game versus Las Vegas. Las Vegas made a couple plays there in week one uh, to steal that one from them. Uh, And then they were fortunate to get that Chiefs game with uh, Clyde Edwards-Hilaire fumbling the – of football as the Chiefs were driving out to kick the game winning field goal. And this one, they've stolen a little bit. So, you know, it's just been tight game, tight game. They found ways to win, which is a little bit what Baltimore does, uh, but they really haven't found themselves uh, so far this year. And uh, it's really interesting. We're going to get into another team out of this own division in the Pittsburgh Steelers and the worry there. Uh, but uh, offensively, they just, don't always look right. Now, some of that might be breaking in their running backs, uh, but uh, it, it, it's just not been smooth so far this year. Yeah, I mean, uh, I believe I, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but I believe Lamar Jackson has uh, gone over 250 yards in three games, I believe. Uh, like I said, I don't have the numbers in front of me, just kind of one of those stats I saw floating by as I was watching sports media. But this was definitely his most complete passing game. Um, even though the numbers don't really show it, 
I believe um, it's the first time in like 17 weeks that he's had such a good passing performance. So I think that speaks a little bit to his uh, receiving corp also. Uh, but ultimately, they got the win. And this is the NFL. This is football. This is kind of the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. You know, you win ugly, and that's all that matters is that you win. Yeah, definitely so. They got the win, so we can't be too much. I'm curious your thoughts on this Detroit team here. Uh, it's really, really interesting. You know, they're 0-3, but I, I think they've played pretty well in all three of those games. Now it it becomes interesting at what point do they sort of pull back and are like, let's not try to get wins here. Let's try to get the number one draft pick here. That's not really Dan Campbell's sort of style, but uh, – I do think they're going to sort of win some games here. Definitely coming up. They got a weak win uh, this week. So uh, what do you make of Detroit here? You know, I think Detroit's in a pretty interesting spot. You know, if they truly believe that golf is their answer going forward, then they're in a really good position because not only can they get a pretty good pick from this season, if it continues going the way it is, but they also have, you know, a couple of, you know, even though it's late in the first round, they have first round picks for the next couple of seasons coming via that trade with Stafford and golf. So they have the opportunity here to not just kind of get something going early on with this core team, but also bring in some nice young talent, uh, you know, first round talent uh, in the next couple of seasons. So I think going forward, they've shown at least the, the potential to be in games and be able to fight. And we've seen a game where they led in the half. We've seen a game where they came back in the second half. And now we've seen a game, where they held the team to under 20 points for the first time since week six of 2020, I think the last time I saw. So, it, you know, they showed signs. I think everything looks good going forward for them. Uh, but obviously if you're a fan right now, you want to see wins. It's just unfortunate the way it's gone down. Yeah. I'm going to pose an interesting question to you about Jared Goff, but I'm going to do it a little bit later when we get to another team in our reviews here. Uh, so it, it'll be interesting to see how Detroit plays, especially this upcoming week when they have a team that's more, I'd say, on their level. Uh, I'm really curious to see how Baltimore sort of bounces back uh, from this game. But uh, we'll move on to our next game in our mutuals. I mentioned your love of this team, and it's becoming destructive, uh, very destructive uh, for you. And uh, I, I think I'm going to break you on this stat. But in the last five years, at no point has this team had a winning record. So that means maybe they started off 1-0. and Maybe they got one of those nice little schedules like the Denver Broncos and started 3-0. and No, this team in the last five years has never had a winning record at any point. And that is the New York Giants, who were favored by two and a half points in this game. They did not win this game. Uh, they gave it to the Atlanta Falcons, who drove down and kicked a game-winning field goal. Uh, other than that, this game was really brutal to we'll watch. Uh, these are two really bad football teams here. Yeah, I, listen, I, I will come. I will open up by saying, I told you <laughs> not to take the Giants. I told you that my love for the Giants uh, was probably, you know, un completely uncalled for, but. You decided to roll with my pick for some weird reason. Uh, and now because of that, we look bad. Uh, but, you know, besides that, as you mentioned, both of these teams are in a really bad place right now. Um, I, you know, it seems like with that, with Atlanta, you have a team with an aging quarterback that's not producing quite at the pace that we're used to seeing him produce. And on the other side of the ball, you have a really, a really young team uh, that has shown potential in games, but, isn't quite ready to kind of go over the hump yet. Uh, and of course, as soon as I start losing some love for them, this is when they'll start playing better. But yeah, overall, it wasn't a very entertaining game, but, you know, I think we learned a few things. Um, on one side of the ball for the Giants, you know, you have a young linebacker that has gotten at least one sack in each game so far. Uh, so they've shown some potential there. And you had the first rushing touchdown for uh, their running back, Saquon Barkley. Um, since I believe a year and a half uh, towards the end of the season before he got hurt. So I think signs are looking up, you know, it looks positive going forward, but as you said, both teams are kind of in a bad spot right now. So there's a lot of building to do. 
Yeah, I, I worry one thing about the Falcons that uh, Cordell Patterson has been their number one offensive weapon in the first three weeks of the season. Uh, I, I don't know if it's a good or bad thing that Arthur Smith has somehow uh, found a way to use him, but uh, it, it seems to have been to the detriment of uh, more highly skilled players in Calvin Ridley and Kyle Pitts and uh, a whole lot of other people. But, uh, you know, I, I wanted to get into the Barkley thing. He is not looked very good i i mean i don't know how healthy he is it it's just it, it becomes difficult uh you know with a draft pick like that and we won't get into their drafting record because it's been very poor the last couple of years uh but now you know you sort of feel like you have to play saquon barkley i don't know if he's healthy because you drafted him you know as a number three pick as a running back and he just does not look right right now I, I i'm just stunned they keep throwing him out there and not just give him you know a, a handful of more weeks off to uh sort of find his uh running legs here because if they can't run the ball they did theoretically bring in receivers they don't seem to be doing anything either and uh evan ingram is completely worthless who i think uh three or four years ago we both probably thought was going to be a you know a nice hybrid tight end and he really does nothing uh so what do you make of saquon barkley here he's just not been really right all year long i will say this at least for you know like i said i'm looking at the giants here with rose colored glasses uh, but i think that he's looked better each week progressively um, I don't think he's quite to where we last saw him, you know, prior to his injury, but I, I still think that he can get there. And as I said, uh, in my eyes, it seems like he's improving week to week. Um, I still don't think he's hundred percent. And I still think that part of it is also mental. We've seen several different circumstances where players get hurt with really bad injuries and they come back. And although physically they seem to be healthy mentally, they're not quite ready yet. It's still you could see a little bit of a, a concern for getting hit or, you know, getting tweaked a certain way or just getting overused. And I think that's part of the issue right here, but it's also a very young team, you know, uh, that I think that they're going to be better, but we're going to have to wait till later on in the season to actually see the effects of um, this team playing together as a whole unit uh, for an entire season. I, I don't think that they're going to get there anytime soon. But as I stated before, uh, I've seen glimpses from just about every facet on this team that lead me to believe that at some point they're going to be a decent team. All right. Well, we'll move on to another team that uh, is not decent right now, at least on one side of the ball. Now, the, I, I will say Pittsburgh uh, did have a handful of their defensive guys sitting. Uh, but anyway, uh, this game wasn't even really close. Uh, the Bengals won 24 to 10. Um, we can get into the Bengals a little bit here. I, I watched a lot of this game. I, I didn't even feel like the Bengals played all that well. And that's how disturbing this is. I, I think we have to get into the, this Pittsburgh Steelers offense. You know, I, I brought it up a little bit last week. And Ben Roethlisberger can no longer play football. Uh, it was highly disturbing what he looked like. They can't get the ball deep. And then this week they were trying to get the ball deep and those passes are nowhere close. It might as well just be me and you out there launching deep passes because they're nowhere near receivers. It's just really, really bad right now on the offensive side of the thing for the Pittsburgh Steelers. What'd you make of this game? It, it, it really disturbed me how sort of bad the Bengals played and yet dominated this game. Now, for the record, as bad as Big Ben looks, I'm 99.9% .9 sure that he could still outthrow me uh, and not, not even close. It's by uh, a few uh, few yards. Uh, but, yes, but it might take him five minutes to wind up and throw the ball. That's the thing. He's got to get time. Uh, you know, it's, it's confusing when you watch this, this Pittsburgh team. I know that the first week they looked really good. Uh, especially on defense. Uh, offensively, they just haven't been the same since, I believe, halfway through last season when they really started slowing down. Um, when I write down my notes for, you know, each particular game, I do like a little a little quick uh, catchphrase or something. Uh, and one of the first things that I put is, Big Ben is falling down. Um, 
and it's only because he's been sacked at least two times in three straight games. Now he's an aging quarterback who's had a lot of issues through, you know, with health uh, throughout his career. He's been hurt several times. When this is your guy, this is the guy you're going to roll with. You have to protect him. He's not the big Ben that we used to see and the guy who can, you know, shake off tacklers. Um, you need a whole gang of tacklers to bring him down. It's not him anymore. He's aging, he's hurting, and he's losing some of his uh, physical skill set. With that being said, you notice that as the game was going by, he's overthrowing guys, he's underthrowing guys, he's missing wide open guys. Um, it, it, he threw for, what, 53 attempts in this game? Yeah. Um, and, and it didn't look good. The completions he did have, they really didn't look that great. Um, there was a few that were made by the receivers. Now, also, I don't know if this is a lack of confidence in the quarterback, but the receivers at points seemed like they gave up on certain plays. Um, even in situations where they should have caught the ball, they drop it. And, and that doesn't help the confidence of the team. So I think they have a lot of issues going forward, but I think they become more um, more obvious to us when that defense is playing back. This was the first time in 76 games that the Steelers did not have a sack on defense. Um, I have to admit, I was wrong. I said before this game that I thought that Steelers defense could put up a good showing even without what, you know, their main, their main defensive anchor. And I was wrong. They couldn't get a single sack in this game. This is going against what we consider to be a not bad, but not good Bengals team. So I think that they have a host of issues going on right now. Um, and probably the main one's going to be health. But if they can get healthy on defense, they can cover up some of the issues that they have on offense. Yeah. Uh, I just worry that they can't because they aren't going to be able to protect Ben all year long. Uh, and I don't even know if that would do any good from what I saw. You know, I, I mentioned it last week. I, I know it probably is very difficult to bench someone who has won numerous Super Bowls, has led your team to numerous wins. Um, and even more so when your backup quarterback is Dwayne Haskins. Uh, but something, if they want to win this year, now if they're just playing out the string this year, you know, and then Ben retires, you know, it is what it is, or they're just waiting for him to get hurt, which inevitably he will <laughs> from what I've seen. Uh, but if they want to win games, he can't be the quarterback of this team with the way that offensive line is. They just need someone younger and fresher. It's, you know, it's not an insult. It's just Ben is Facts. sort of, it, it, he's shot. He's done, I, you know, and he's not going to be able to win them games anymore. And this is where I wanted to bring this up to you. Why wouldn't Pittsburgh, I know this is not the NBA and teams don't do this, but there is technically a trade deadline. Why wouldn't they try to make a trade for someone like Jared Goff, who's sitting in a, you know, worthless situation for the Detroit Lions? I doubt he's their quarterback of the future. So why don't they go after somebody like that? Uh, you know, I, I just, if they want to win and you put Jared Goff in this situation, I think that raises Pittsburgh's ceiling from six win team to probably a 10-11 win team just right there. See, I think that – I understand your your argument there, but I don't see the gap between Big Ben and Goff to be all that wide. And I'll tell you why. I, I think the biggest issue for Goff has always been pressure. When you can pressure him, he makes mistakes. He gets jumpy, he gets finicky, and he starts making mistakes. You look at this Pittsburgh offense – and right now their biggest issue is the offensive line. They just can't protect the quarterback. Part of it has to do with the fact, as you said, Big Ben's an aging guy, so he's not as mobile. But Goff isn't the most mobile guy either. He kind of stands to stand there like a statue. So you're going to have the same issues where the quarterback's getting pressure. You know, at least with Big Ben, you know what you're getting, you know, in terms of like the mental uh, – his mental state when he's under pressure. Goff, he's shown, you know, so many different opportunities where – he could make a play, but he gets too finicky or he gets too worried about the pressure coming at him in his face, and he makes mistakes. So I don't think that the gap, just based off where the offensive line sits, 
is all that wide right now between those two guys. So I understand just writing out what now, if you could make a trade, you know, and you're getting golf for a lot cheaper than, you know, potentially he would be worth, then it would make sense. But as it sits right now, I don't think that the talent gap is that is wide enough to make a move like that. All right. I just, I, I figure if the Steelers want to do something and they strike me as a franchise who doesn't really go into rebuilding mode all that much or that often, it, it doesn't even have to be like somebody like golf. And I'm not saying they need to go out there and try to make a move to get Aaron Rodgers, uh, because that's not going to happen. But I think if you just get some of those mid tier quarterbacks that, you know, are not in the future of some teams, you know, I uh, Gardner Minshew, Sam Darnold probably would have been a much better decision in the off season. Uh, you know, uh, but you know, it seems like golf would be one of the ones that would be available because I doubt, you know, Detroit really has any ties to him long term. Uh, and if they could get off that money, which probably is the main reason why Pittsburgh could not pull something like that off. Uh, why not go after him? I think it raises your ceiling uh, at least a little bit uh, just because he's a little bit fresher. He, you know, I, he's not going to win a 40 race, but he can at least move around in that pocket a little bit better than Ben can. You know, his throws come out a little bit quicker than Ben's can. I think it just would give a little bit more spark in life to that Pittsburgh offense. I think that's all they need, a little bit of spark in life. And I think that can change this uh, offensive team for Pittsburgh here because uh, they got skill position, guys. Now, I, as much as I agree with you, I will say this. The Steelers seem to be one of the franchises that puts a lot of emphasis in loyalty. Um, Just don't and go get Nick Foles. That... <laughs> you know, as a, it, it seems like the Steelers franchise puts a lot of emphasis on loyalty, and that's probably one of the reasons why they're still sticking with, you know, uh, Big Ben. Um, and I don't know, it seems like they're on the right track. They've got the skill position players, you know, um, uh, Harris, um, uh, he's had 60 touches plus this season so far, which, uh, is the most of the three games for a rookie running back. Now, that being said, they haven't all been on the ground, which is part of the problem. I think you have to have a more balanced team, but especially with an aging quarterback, you got to balance the run a little bit more. Uh, a lot of his touches are coming in past situations. So that's not something you want to see, but. I understand where you're coming from, uh, but really quickly before we move on from this game, I do want to give a shout out to Jamar Chase, who seems to be developing into a really good deep threat, uh, you know, going into the season. Um, he's looking really good, and, and I thought we had to give him a little bit of a uh, props uh, before we move on. Yeah, I was going to switch to Cincinnati side of things. Uh, this is two wins. Uh, you know, I, I watched them. They they aren't all that good a team, but uh, two wins. Uh, what do you think the ceiling is here for this Bengals team? I, I still don't see it much over about five, six wins here. No, um, I think I would have to see <clears> – <throat> sorry, I would have to see this going for a few more weeks against more competitive teams in order for me to become a believer. I think that right now this is a good team win. It's good for team morale and team chemistry, but um, that's about it. You beat, a, uh, you beat a divisional opponent, which, you know, as, as I always say, divisional games tend to be really close and can be upsets. So I think it's a good team win, and you learn from this and you move on. There's still a lot of building that they have to do there, but I'm sure they feel good, you know, coming out of this one. Yeah. All right. Uh, we'll move on to our next win in the sheet and the big win for you. The Los Angeles Rams, plus one versus the Tampa Bay Bucks. We got that win. Uh, nice win for the Rams here, 34-24. Uh, I thought they really dominated this game and uh, dominated sort of how I thought they would. Uh, I, I thought Tampa Bay's offense would regress a little bit here uh, because they were actually coming up against a uh, defense, uh, unlike the first couple of weeks in the season. I, I've sort of liked how this uh, Rams offense has worked a little bit. Um, I still think it's a little bit 
uh, one-sided uh, Cooper Cup. They can't, haven't seen, haven't seemed to be able to get uh, Robert Woods all that involved uh, as much as I thought they would, or Higby for that matter. I, I thought Higby would be much better after an open week. He's sort of been invisible a little bit in the next two games, uh, but the offense seems to be running pretty smoothly. Uh, I, I thought this was the best the defense has looked so far uh, this year. Uh, a little bit, probably, of that has to do with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, can't run the ball uh, at all so far uh, this year. But uh, I, I thought really impressive overall game by the Rams here. Yeah, uh, you know, this is the one game that I sat down and watched completely from beginning to end. Um, I had to later watch highlights for the afternoon games because – I did not change the channel. You know, obviously I'm a big Ram fan. And, you know, when my team's on uh, game of the week, I'm probably going to leave it on that channel. That being said, I thought Tampa Bay did a pretty good job showing up. Uh, I know that the expectations were really high. And as you stated before, a lot of it had to do with the fact uh, that they won their first two games. But those two games were up against opponents that either had no defense or had poor offense. Uh, so, you know, how much – you take that with a grain of salt, I guess. But this was a, a good key matchup to show where both teams stand. And I was really nervous about it. I thought the Buccaneers would show up. And as a matter of fact, I kept telling everybody uh, back at work that I had a feeling the Rams were going to get crushed. Now, I didn't really believe this, but I said this just in case it happened. I didn't look like a total homer. Uh, but as you mentioned, the Rams – and Cooper, you know, Stafford and Cooper Cup have this chemistry going on right now. And it seems like it's really one, one dimensional to where if a defense really focuses on keeping Cup out of the game, it might affect the, uh, the, the Rams offense. But I, I do have to say, I noticed some good things from Higby. Deshaun Jackson got in this game and there were a few opportunities he had to score big touchdowns. Uh, so that's also a plus. It seems like now you have a deep threat. It's going to open things up in the middle for guys like Cooper more than Cup. three weeks that his hamstrings stay alive. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, three <laughs> weeks, it might be all we need. So uh, we'll take it. Uh, I thought the, the biggest concern here was the, uh, the running attack for the Rams. Their defense showed up. I, I will say, I didn't think the defense was playing all that well the first couple of weeks and defense played really well this, this particular week. I think they were really pumped up about the opponent. So that has something to do with it, but the running back is the biggest concern for me. Uh, I thought that, you know, Sony looked good at times. He, he looks good once he gets going. To me, he's kind of like a big Rick truck. You know, he's going to start off really slow. He's not going to get you those really uh, sports car type of cuts. But once he gets going, he's hard to stop. He's going to break tackles. He's going to push you a couple extra yards. Um, he showed probably once or twice a, a really nice get up off the line. Uh, but other than that, I thought that he looked kind of slow. Uh but he got the job done, so I can't really fault him for that. There are reports that Henderson might be back for this upcoming week. That still remains to be seen. It's up in the air. But overall, I thought it was a good team win, and uh, I'm sure they're looking forward to their next opponent, which is undefeated Cardinals. It's going to be a good game. Yeah, that should be an entertaining game. All right, I, I wanted to talk a little bit here about Tampa Bay. Uh, you know, I, I thought this game played out a lot like I thought it would, uh, you know, Offensively, they weren't all that great last year. They won the Super Bowl last year, mostly based on that defense. I know they have all the names on the offensive side of things, uh, but their defense is really what carried them. And it's been really, really poor this year. Uh, you know, Devin White has been literally atrocious this year. If you go look at his sort of metric numbers in the games, uh, I, I thought Levante David and, and Dominic and Sue has looked a little bit uh, – long in the tooth you know sue's been around forever and david's been you know making plays for that tampa bay bucks team for a while now it, it just seems they're a little bit old they've had a lot of injuries on the secondary they just signed richard sherman i'm not sure that's going to help the uh, aging curve there on the defensive side of things uh but you know what do you make of the play here of this tampa bay bucks defense it's just sort of a continuation uh, you know, weeks one, two, three. Now, you know, you can say they played the Cowboys in week one. That's a really good offense. You know, in week three, they played the Rams. That's a really good offense. Uh, the Falcons went probably a little bit more disturbing from uh, what we saw this last week and in week one. Uh, we'll get into that Philly game uh, next up. But uh, what do you make here of this Tampa Bay Bucks defense here? You know, as you stated, uh, a lot of people really like to 
uh, look at this Bucks offense and kind of assume that this is the reason why they won the Super Bowl. Uh, but realistically, it was because of that defense. That defense was really shutting people down. Um, I mean, I believe this was a first loss for Tampa Bay since week 12 of last season. So it was. And it's because of that defense. That defense was playing stout. They, they, were, they were really good. And they do have a lot of big names on defense. But I think that their defensive scheme has been kind of figured out a little bit. And not to say that they're going to be stopped, but I think that it's been figured out enough to where you can at least game plan you know, to where you're going to shift your, your protection to uh, which side of the ball you're going to throw to on third down and think, things of that sort. Um, I think that's the biggest issue. I think that one of the problems in the NFL is that, you know, teams every year tend to get better. They get better and better because they draft guys, they pick up guys at free agency. Tampa Bay, as good as they were last season, it's the same team. You know, whereas in every other NFL team, even if they were worse than Tampa Bay, they've gotten better. So I think there's something to be said about that. Um, it's you got a whole year of film on the way this team uh, as a whole kind of, you know, puts puts a game out there. So there's so many different factors that are going to go into it. I think they're going to get better as the season progresses as they kind of start getting into more of a rhythm. But with that being said, I think it is a little worrisome that the first two games of the week you went up against what would be considered mediocre opponents, either on offense or defense. Um, in the first game where you went up against a team that a lot of people consider to be a good team in the Rams, um, and they gave you fits. So it's probably something to be concerned about going forward. But again, the season's still pretty early, so there's still a lot of games to be played. Yeah, it's something to keep your eye on a little bit. I, I still sort of think these teams are a little bit in preseason mode here in, in week three of the season. Uh, so, you know, it, it's not like sound alarm bells, but the way they're giving up points and sort of the way – uh, some of those guys that carried this defense uh, last year, especially the Devin White one, probably the most concerning uh, one with the way he started the season out, uh, has not been good. And uh, he was a big, big reason this defense was as good as it was uh, last year. So a little bit concerned there. Uh, offense did what I thought it was. You know, it, it sort of finds ways to get points here and there. But uh, it, it's sort of a mediocre offense, uh, I, I think, especially – with the running game even worse uh, than it was last year. So uh, I think that offense always will sort of somewhat struggle uh, when they come up against defenses like that. Uh, it's probably just more of a question if that defense can find itself and uh, sort of wreck havoc uh, versus offenses like the Rams in these future games coming up uh, versus big teams. All right, our uh, last game on the sheet was a big, big loss. And uh, I, I got a little nervous on uh, Sunday, and I will say uh, – this didn't actually make it into our mutuals 50 on five bets uh, because the spread went down to three. I did not take it on our Friday recording of the uh, said show, and I was not going to take the Eagles at uh, plus three, uh, especially with everybody in the world for some reason betting on them. So uh, technically it was a mutuals uh, 50 on four last week. But uh, anyway, we did say it nonetheless on the show. Uh and I apologize to anyone who bet on the Eagles uh, in this game because they were pretty much uh, whipped from the start of the game to the end of the game. 41-21, uh, that makes it sound even closer than it actually was. Uh, the Cowboys were all over them on the offensive side of things. I, I think we started to see where this real Philly team is uh, defensively, uh, you know, erase everything you saw in that Falcons game sort of pick up what we've seen the last two weeks uh, versus the Niners and versus the Cowboys here. This defense is going to struggle. Offensively, it once again did not look good. And uh, this Dallas defense, if you can't look good versus it, uh, you might have some problems uh, coming up ahead. I will say that it was a little surprising, you know, especially after the first two weeks. I kind of assumed that Philly would offensively at least kind of get their thing, their motor going. Uh, didn't quite work out for them. I, I did say on our Friday show, on our pick show, that this game was going to be contingent on a lot of things, but the main thing was going to be that pass rush. If that Philly pass rush could affect the Cowboys' offensive line enough and get some pressure on Prescott, that they could be in this game. And it seems like that was really the issue. They couldn't get pressure on him. And even when they did, he was able to kind of scramble out and find an open receiver. Um, offensively, the Cowboys look good. They look as good as we assume they're going to be. But 
I think the biggest question mark here was that uh, that Eagles offense, because as you said, if you can't look good offensively against this Cowboys defense, then there's probably some worry there, something to worry about. Um, I don't know if it's the quarterback situation. I don't know if it's a wide receiver situation, but there's definitely some concerns here. Um, I, I think Philly's going to be one of those teams that's going to be really hard to gauge, uh, at least for the you know rest of this uh, half of the season. Uh, we're going to be have a hard time deciding which Philly team we're going to get. Whether it's going to be that pass rush Philly team that keeps you know their t- their offense in games, or that offense that just doesn't show up even against poor defenses. So it's going to be really confusing going forward. But um, you know, good win for the Cowboys, especially against a divisional opponent. Yeah, uh, definitely so. Thought the Cowboys looked pretty good. Uh, Zeke find, found a little bit of form this week. Uh, finally, uh, Pollard continued to play well. I, I will ask you this question. I, I noticed it last week. I saw it again a little bit this week, the play of Dak Prescott. It, it's not bad by any means, but it, it this team doesn't look quite as explosive, uh, you know, on the – offensive side of things receiver wise uh and him making big passes and plays down the stretch now some of that you know might just be they're changing offensive schemes to protect him a little bit better they got up in this game big so there might not be as big a reason for that uh but you know in week one you know they threw all over the place on those on the tampa bay bucks and then in week two they really ran the ball a ton against the chargers uh with zeke and with pollard ton of carries didn't really let Dak open up and it was a little bit more the same here now uh that being said they won those two games that they uh sort of ran the ball a lot in and lost technically the tampa bay game now you know all three of these games uh two of them could have gone either which way so you know that's being that I, I'm just wondered if you're a little bit worried uh, about Dak or you just think uh, they have sort of schemed it a little bit where they're going to try to run the ball a little bit more in these games and uh, maybe not uh, expose the defense quite as much. Well, I mean, if you're Dallas, if you're any team, you know, for that matter in the NFL, you know, you want to have some sort of balance. Uh, good balance leads to a predictability uh, on the offensive side of the ball, which leads to, the opposing defense having a hard time game planning against what you're going to do. Um, Amari Cooper, I think, is the reason why this offense doesn't look as explosive as it did last season. Um, he's slowed down a lot. Um, we haven't seen much of him through the first three weeks compared to the first three weeks of last season. And as, as you mentioned, their, we, their wins have been more balanced, you know, a little run heavier than, than normal, but – I think that's a good thing going forward. If you don't have to rely so much on Prescott, if you take some of the pressure off of him and give him the ability to kind of, you know, hand it off to, to Elliot, um, I think it's, it, it's better going forward. It's going to create a healthier offense. It's going to create less pressure in your offensive line, um, which could in turn keep him healthier for longer. This team has the type of offense that will keep him in games. You know, defensively is where they have their struggles. So if they can kind of keep a good balance where they get control of the clock, have good clock management, uh, then I think they're going to be okay going forward. But I do understand why some people would be concerned when you look at just the numbers. But I think that the the lack of offensive through the air or offense through the air is probably a good team, a good thing for this team. Yeah, uh, I just I, I sort of picked up on it a little bit. He did do a good job of, of finding his tight ends in this game. They just you know, from looking at them from game one of the season where they pretty much threw on every down versus Tampa Bay and were trying to hit big plays into the last two games, it, it seemed a little bit more uh, cautious and conservative. Uh, I don't know if that's a game plan sort of thing or a Dak Prescott uh, sort of thing. I, I we'll probably find out a little bit more, uh, but uh, let's switch to Philly a little bit here. Uh I thought Jalen Hurts looked pretty bad again this week off of a, you know, a bad set versus San Francisco. I can sort of understand the San Francisco thing. It, I don't quite understand if you're having bad games uh, versus the Cowboys sort of thing, though. But uh, what do you make of this Eagles offense? Uh, good, bad, just sort of ugly. I, I like their skill position, guys. That's why I'm just wondering if they have the right guy at quarterback here. Yeah, I mean, listen, so far the first two weeks, he's shown up. 
you know, he was one of the leading rushers for quarterback. That being said, this week he looked really bad. And it wasn't so much – I think a part of it was, as I mentioned with the Cowboys, is balance on offense. Now, I know they got down early and they had to sort of try and come back in this game, uh, which, by the way, helped me out on my five-pick parlay. But um, they had no balance. I think they ran the ball combined, what, like 10 times in this game uh, for like 40 yards, 30 or something. I can't, I don't even have the numbers in front of me, but I know it wasn't good. Uh, If you look at his passing numbers, they look okay. I believe he had over 300 yards passing. He had uh, a couple of touchdowns, but he also had a few picks. There was no balance. If you had some sort of balance, um, I don't understand these teams that get down in the first half and they just completely go up on the run. Like, I know you have to try and make a comeback. I know you have to score points, but you have to remain balanced. It's really important to remain balanced because it it makes you more unpredictable. Simple. So I I think that's probably one of the reasons why his numbers look so poor uh, as an offensive unit. Um, I don't think that they're that bad. I think they'll be better going forward, but – Again, we just don't know what we're getting from this Philly defense, which is probably the biggest question mark. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, you know, you said it. Uh, these teams now get down all of a sudden, and then it's, you know, you stall it in that Steelers game. It's like, okay, well, let's not use our our first-round running back that we spent money on. Let's just throw 55 times with a quarterback who's not even capable of throwing 55 times in a game anymore. And, and you mentioned on this one, yes, I know they got down, and – but it, that doesn't make a ton of sense to me because the clock still runs. It, you complete a 10-yard slant, you complete a five-yard run, the clock is going to run either which way. So you aren't really saving all that much time, uh, especially if you're an Eagles team who hasn't shown the ability to get a lot of chunk yardage plays. I get it if you're the Chiefs and you get down 14 and you want to throw every time. Uh, they're capable of hitting 70-yard plays uh, on more than one occasion. The Eagles, I don't think, are capable of hitting a lot of 70-yard plays. So, uh, yeah, I agree. They sort of lost their balance there. They just didn't look like the better team in this one. Uh, they really haven't looked great since that week one victory over the Falcons. So it'll be interesting to see if they really are uh, capable of remaining in this NFC East Uh uh, we haven't gotten into it, but uh, that that side, uh, I, I think the Cowboys pretty much have a free reign here. We haven't gotten to the Washington football team, but uh, they look uh, pretty terrible. Uh, we've already gone over the Giants, and we just went over Philly. So uh, I don't even know how good the Cowboys have to be to win this division uh, so far. But uh, we'll move on to our picks after a two and three day in our mutuals. I had a tough day overall in my picks, not a definite tough day in the wallet necessarily, uh, cause I was counting on one pick, uh, really, but, uh, two and four on the week. That brings me to 15, 10 and one on the year. I got a win in the new Orleans saints plus two and a half versus the new England Patriots game. Uh, saints, uh, really just dominated this game, uh, on the ground, uh, defensively, uh, it's more of the same with the New England uh, side of things. Thought the defense played okay, but uh, this time Mac Jones was even turning the ball over. Uh, you, you mentioned balance in this one. They threw the ball a ton uh, with Mac Jones in this one. I didn't understand that at all other than I, I just didn't understand it, especially when James White got hurt. But uh, what would you make of this uh, New England Saints game here? Now, I'll open up by saying that I don't have many notes on this particular game. Um, I just – I think it was probably one of the poorer games of the week. Uh, I know that it was entertaining if you were a Patriot fan, Saint fan, because uh, you learned a few things about each team. But, you know, I don't know. I don't know if Mac Jones is quite ready yet. I understand that they made the move early on, uh, you know, during preseason where they decided to let go Ken. I don't know if he's ready yet. I don't know if the pressures of that New England lore and championship, you know, over the last 20 years, um, I don't know if that's weighing in on him and making it harder for him to perform or or what the deal is. I'm sure that not having a lot of skill position players on the outside 
uh, is probably contributing to, you know, his, I'm not going to say poor showing, but to the lack of, uh, I, I can't even word it. I mean, it's just, it, it was, it was a tough game to watch. Um, I think for the saints, you know, you're probably happy to come out with the win in this one. Uh, you know, you accumulated 252 total yards and still came out in a win. I believe it was the first time they've done that. Um, in a road win since uh, Sean Payton's been the coach. So that was a positive thing going forward for them. But they also didn't look that great. Uh, you know, Alvin Kamara, they had a little more balance on offense for the Saints. Alvin Kamara ran for 89 yards, which is more than his first two games combined. So that's a good sign going forward. On both sides of the ball for both teams. Uh, I expected this to be more of a defensive struggle for the Patriots. I thought that they'd show up defensively and it seemed like they did in that first quarter. And then they just completely slipped the way the game got away from them. Uh, and then it wasn't close. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned it, uh, you know, the Patriots skill guys, I, I think are still really, really poor. I think you're finding out why the chargers and the Titans were sort of okay with not paying for, you know, Hunter Henry and John U. Smith and sort of why Las Vegas was sort of okay with letting Ness Nelson Algalore go, even though uh, he had a great season for him the year before. Uh, you know, I, I don't think those guys are worth the money they're being paid. They still look like a, just a not explosive offense all that much. They haven't, they didn't run the ball well at all. And then they abandoned the run in this game. I will say, if we're talking about good things out of this game, I think the Saints defense has really uh, played well, really well two weeks uh, out of their three games. But I thought they played pretty well in that Carolina game too. It's just the offense was so, so bad in that one. Uh, they couldn't overcome it. So I will say I think the Saints defense, I think we were a little concerned. Maybe it might have a little bit of a drop off with some of the guys they lost. Uh, it, it looks to be as strong as ever, the Saints defense. Uh, you mentioned it offensively. Other than getting Kamara going on the ground a little bit, uh, this passing game was still kind of shaky and poor. It'll be interesting to see where that comes from. It, it'll be really interesting to see how good this Patriots uh, team really becomes because, uh, you know, I mentioned the NFC East looking bad. Uh, the AFC uh, side of things, uh, really looks like a runaway for Buffalo. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure what of those uh, other three teams we've seen uh, so far can even come close uh, to really contending uh, with the Buffalo Bills on that side of things. So uh, disappointing for the Patriots, but uh, Saints got another win. I don't know if they're capable quite yet of moving them up in that upper echelon of teams uh, yet from what I've seen offensively. But uh they put another win in the books and a road win in New England is still a good win to have on those sort of things. All right. Uh, I lost the Pittsburgh Cincinnati game. We talked about that a little bit. Uh, I think we'll combine these next two games that I lost on uh, Jags and the uh, Arizona Cardinals. I, I lost that one and the uh, Jets and Broncos game. Not a, uh, the Jags Cardinals game was, as you might expect the Cardinals do, uh, was a tight game until Trevor Lawrence uh, threw a pick six. They were actually winning uh, that game 1914 until the pick six came. So that scoring margin actually uh, was a little bit uh, off of what the actual game was. The Jags were right there for most of it. Uh, Jets Broncos game. Uh, the Jets just aren't really a good football team right now. Uh, Let's start with the Broncos here. Uh, are you believing this 3-0 and record or just the fact that they've somehow managed to play the Jets, Jags, and uh, Giants <laughs> to start the season? I know. I, I am a bit of a believer because we mentioned it last season. We thought that this team uh, was built pretty well. Um, they were just a quarterback away from at least being able to be competitive. Um, with that being said, they've got a really hot start, you know, starting off 3-0. and um, And as you mentioned, it, it was against some pretty bad teams. But, you know, it, that doesn't matter at the end of the day. What matters is wins. Uh, it, and currently right now they are um, in first place in their division. So um, I, I think they'll take that either way. You have the Chiefs and you have uh, the Chargers looking up. So um, And Vegas. Yeah, so so you know that division good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's a good place to be, and I know that, like you said, it's against some 
okay teams. You're not, you know, talking about the elites, but <clears throat> they've shown flashes. You know, they've got some pretty good weapons on offense. They've got really good weapons on defense. So, yeah, at least, you know, in contention for a playoff spot. Yeah. Uh, anything to say on the uh, Jets other than uh, I- I'm a little nervous uh, about how they're treating Zach Wilson here. Um, we'll get into some other uh, bad decisions about uh, teaching quarterbacks uh, things, but uh, I-, I didn't like the comment that Sala came out with in his practice conference. I don't know what's wrong on Wednesday and Thursday in practice. He looks great. And I'm like, well, yes, uh, that's it's the practice. NFL. <laughs> I'm glad he looks great in shorts uh, and he's playing your second string defense. Uh, maybe not call 400 billion passes and have him throwing deep balls the whole game uh, versus really good defenses. I will say that too. The Jets, you flip it sort of around. The Broncos have probably played the easiest schedule. Uh, the Jets have played, you know, probably three of the uh, toughest defenses in the league in Carolina, the Patriots and the Broncos. So, you know, that's really a tough start. Uh, so anything on the jets much other than they're not a very good football team right now. Uh, you know, when I'm looking at my notes, I have three notes for this game and they're all jets related. Um, one, the jets have lost 12 straight games when trailing at halftime. Uh, Wilson has the most interceptions by a Jets rookie in the first three games. And Wilson is the only Jets quarterback to be sacked four times in each of the first three starts. So all three negative things. Um, I, I can't put them all on the young quarterback. I think some of them have to be scheme wise uh, for his protection. Some of them have to be scheme wise for his play calling. Uh, and then some of them have to be just the lack of talent in the team overall. So I can't put, I can't put them all on him. Uh, but it's still, you know, kind of uh, concerning if you're a Jets fan. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, – they aren't protecting him. That always gets me nervous about rookie quarterbacks. I mean, you're just – you're you're putting knocks on him and getting him jittery in the pocket each time. He thinks every time he's going to drop back, he's going to get hit. And the uh, weapons on this team are just non-existent. Uh, and that's – probably the most disturbing thing he's literally not throwing to anyone uh that is even a functional number three receiver in the nfl uh so you know i I just worry about his progression now they start to ease it out a little bit in the schedule here you know i mentioned tough teams the first three probably if you're a rookie quarterback three teams you don't want to go up against so Maybe he gets a little bit better there. I I will say uh, we'll move to the Jaguars here. I've sort of liked their progression on the season. They're getting a little closer in each week. It's not great, uh, but they got killed in that Texans game. Uh, I thought they played the Broncos tough. That was a 14-10 game going into the fourth quarter. In this one, they were winning into it. Uh, Now, granted, some of that has to do with Cliff Kingsbury uh, deciding to kick a 70-yard field goal and, of course, having a return on him. Uh, You can explain that decision-making to me. I don't know at some point in time in life. Uh, I won't quite understand it. The only things that seem to could happen in that play are bad. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, they were winning 1914. I-, I thought that flea flicker was just a stupid play to call. And then, you know, Lawrence even checked the ball down short. And of course, it gets big six. Uh, but I-, I think the Jags are playing a little bit better week by week uh, here. Uh, They still aren't great, but uh, that also might be a little bit of Arizona, who I continue to sort of have questions about a little bit here. Yeah, I mean, when you look at at the Jaguars, you have a young rookie quarterback. You have coaching in college for several, several, several years. Um, It's going to be a learning curve. There's going to be it's going to be a process here. This isn't going to be, you know, week one. They're going to start winning games right away. First of all, they had to get this team going uh, chemistry-wise, um, and you have to really implement your system. You know, you can't really do that the first three weeks of a season. It's really hard to do that. There's very few coaches who can pull that off. So I'm not going to hold any of this against the quarterback or the coach. Um, I-, I thought they've looked competitive when they couldn't look competitive. This particular game against Arizona, I, I thought Arizona was really shooting themselves in the foot, and it goes back to the things we've talked about with Arizona They look really good and they look flashy. 
but they're too dependent on these type of plays. And this is what happens when this when you're dependent on them. They were down early, and I was like, okay, I, I guess my parlay screwed because I, I thought the Cardinals were gonna you know roll in this one, um, and they ended up rolling. But it took until basically, like you said, that uh, that field goal attempt that really kind of uh, changed the momentum. It seems like Arizona really settled down, and uh, they started playing their type of game after that. Uh, but I will say, I'm always one of those guys, especially back when the Rams had Zerline. When the clock was ticking down to three seconds at uh, near halftime, I was always like, "Why not try for a uh, you know record-setting field goal?" And now I see why they don't. Uh, but I, I do want to give uh, you know credit to uh, uh, Jamal Agnews who uh, scored a 109-yard uh, return touchdown. Yeah, uh, all time the the record for the longest play in NFL history. So uh, do got to give him some props. Yeah, definitely. So. Uh... It, it, I, I do hate this like Urban Meyer bashing where it's like, why isn't he better? I thought this team was going to be better. And I'm like, you know, how about to give him at least a, a, a season before we, you know, try to bash him and have him fired. It, it drives me nuts. You know, personality wise, I, I can't stand Urban Meyer, but he has been a successful football coach. So let's give him more than three games into a NFL season with a rookie quarterback here before we start, you know, calling this just a bad move. I get it. Uh, he's very easy to not like, and I don't personally like him, but he has been a good football coach. So, you know, give him a little bit more time here. Yeah, it's it's really unfair to try and you know, cut the uh, the coach's head off after three weeks. I think uh, you got to give him a little more time than that. I know that's some like Premier League soccer stuff uh, there. Where well, that's a little out of my in. element, but I, yeah. but I get where you're coming from. Yes, I know. That's three weeks in. We're ready to fire the coach and bring in someone new. All right. Uh, uh, the last one I had was the Rams. I split it with Rams, and they won. And then Rams. Bucks under. I want to thank Tampa Bay for uh, scoring that last second touchdown and ruining that one. Uh, anytime you can score meaningless touchdowns and uh, continue to give Brady fake touchdowns onto a season that's an extra one longer, go for it. Uh, it's not like it affects uh, gambling or anything like that. But uh, anyway, two and four on the week for me. Uh, you went three and five. Your first one was a win here. You had the Buffalo Bills minus four and a half uh, versus the Washington football team. You pretty much could have had any Buffalo you wanted. Buffalo annihilated the Washington football team here. It was 43-21. Even that is a little nice because Washington got some weird sort of uh, onside kick in the first half uh, to gain them an extra possession. Uh, Basically, they scored 14 points, and the Bills did whatever they wanted on the offensive side of things here. Uh, just curious in this game, what are you a little bit more? Uh, Washington's defense, or you think the Bills' offense has sort of found its way here and is going to roll through the rest of this season? Uh, you know, it seems like they're starting to find a little more balance. Again, this is the theme of this week is balance on offense. seems like they're starting to find a little more balance. Uh, and it's helping the team out when you're not putting all the pressure for uh, Josh Allen to, you know, get those yards on the ground. Uh, it, it kind of frees him up to perform better through the air. Um, you know, he's the first player in Buffalo history with four passing touchdowns, no interceptions uh, and a rushing touchdown in the game. So uh, make, make that of it what you will. Uh, but they they won their game. Uh, and this was against a team that potentially had a really good defense. Now they haven't flipped into Washington side of the ball. Uh, Defensively, I don't think they've performed up to the standard that we thought they were going to. And they've had injuries on offense, which have only hurt that team even more. Uh, but overall, you know, you're going up against one of the better teams in the league. And, yeah, you got smoked. And it was pretty much, a, you know, a done with conclusion early on in that game. But, you know, I don't think you can really hold your head, you know, down if you're Washington. I think that you kind of just hope your defense picks up their play and hope that you get some guys healthy again. And maybe this is a different story going forward. But uh, for Buffalo, you know, a good win, a win they were supposed to get. Um, and as you mentioned earlier uh, in our, you know, New England recap, it looks like this division is theirs to lose. So um, as long as they keep playing the way they are, I don't see how they can. 
Yeah, uh, I think Buffalo's found the rhythm. I think we're going to look back and wonder how the hell they lost to the Pittsburgh Steelers at the end of this uh, season when we're doing our recaps. Uh, we aren't going to remember what went on in that uh, game. But uh, I, I think I, I've watched Washington, you know, three weeks in a row now uh, pretty intently. And uh, this does not look like a good football team. Uh, I, I'm getting a little bit concerned here. Uh, maybe the offense can sort of piece it together, but this defense, it, it's pretty much gotten picked on for three weeks in a row. Uh, so I just, I, I'm getting a little worried that this team, uh, this, what you see is sort of what you're going to get uh, the rest of the year. Now, granted, they probably won't go up against an offense like Buffalo every single week, but uh, they've gone up against, uh, you know, sort of mid-tier offenses in the first two weeks and uh, haven't looked all that great either. So I will admit I'm starting to get a little bit worried about this uh, Washington team here. Now, I, I do want to say something really quick. Um, I had more Buffalo picks. Um, I, I don't know why I last season I decided to go with the system where whatever picks I make in real life, I'm going to make in the show. Um, and – this season, I was trying something different. I had a lot of Buffalo picks, which netted me uh, some nice extra moolah. But I think we're going to have to switch back to that because uh, now that I hear my record, I did a lot better in my personal picks uh, than I did in our show picks. So I think we're going to switch up the format a little bit. All right. Uh, we'll switch up the format uh, to this next game. Uh, this was uh, a loser on your end. The Chicago Bears, Cleveland Browns, first half over 23 and a half. Uh, I should just warn you, as long as uh, Nagy is coaching the Chicago Bears, uh, do not take overs. Um, Cleveland dominated this game pretty easily. Uh, I, I think uh, Miles Garrett uh, probably won the SAC uh, championship just based solely on this game. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know if that's going to be enough to make me believe Cleveland's defense is better than what it had been in the first two weeks, uh, but they certainly uh, found their rhythm uh, this week, uh, possibly. Uh, just a suggestion here. You might want to help 40-year-old uh, Jason Peters on the left tackle side of things, one-on-one -on -one versus uh, Garrett there. Uh, he might not have the spring in his legs to uh, <laughs> stay with someone like that. Uh, That's a bit of an understatement. I, I don't know if Nagy picked up on that. Uh, apparently he didn't because Garrett was running fast in the whole game. Uh, but uh, Cleveland dominated this game pretty easy. Hard to really gauge anything off Cleveland in this one, uh, really just sort of a lopsided, terrible game. Yeah, I mean, uh, he, here are some of my stats. Now, I did hear, though, that uh, Kirk Cousins, you know, quarterback of the Minnesota Vikings, divisional rival of the uh, Chicago Bears, uh, I, I did hear he had one quote for, this, for the score of this game, and it was directed at Bears fans, and it was, you like that? <laughs> because – it seems like everyone was clamoring for Justin Fields to come on, you know, as the starting quarterback and you got a total of one net yard. Now he had 68 passing yards for the game, but with all the sacks he took and the losses of yards, one net yard. Um, I think it was really concerning if you're a Bears fan that this is the type of product that you're putting on the field. Uh, and I will talk about Matt Nagy a little later on in the show, uh, hint, hint, uh, but the Browns dominated. Uh, you know, they came out, they took care of business. Uh, we thought they would win this game. They were a much better team. I, I did think that the possibility of having young quarterback Justin Fields there might have kind of uh, pumped up, you know, the Bears into showing some sort of offense because they haven't been completely dead. We saw week one against the Ram team. Uh, it, they were, of course, they were led by, you know, uh, Dalton at that time. Um, the Bears didn't look horrible. They looked like they could be, adequate they look like they could perform and keep up with most teams um now it's a different story when you have a quarterback who for one is not being protected he, he part of it you can't put all the blame on him um i know that his performance looks really bad but you can't put all the perform blocking play calling just the whole team performance as a whole i think this is one that you crumple up throw in the trash and you move on to next week because it, it was a really bad performance yeah uh i'm going to say something sort of okay about Nagy, and then I'm going to crush him here. Okay. Uh, you know, he sort of said Fields isn't ready. Uh, you know, 
and we saw why. He's not ready. He watches him in practice every day. He knows that he's not ready, especially with this offensive line. So he warned everybody, this is why you play Andy Dalton, because Andy Dalton knows how to go on different reads, knows how to shift protections so he doesn't get murdered by Miles Garrett 75 times a game. He, he knows how to pretty much ignore said coach and shift a running back over there to chip Miles Garrett so Jason Peters isn't one-on-one. -on -one. This is why you play Andy Dalton and not Fields. Uh, that would be the nice thing I'm going to say about Nagy. Uh, now I'm not going to say nice things. Uh, <laughs> if the Bears want Fields to be any sort of quarterback, uh, they need to get rid of Nagy now. They need to get rid of Ryan Pace now. I would not let them anywhere near trying to bring a quarterback into this uh, functional season. I would put them far, far away. He already ruined Mitch Trubisky, uh, so why are you going to let him ruin somebody else? It's clear he does not have any clue how to set up an offense for uh, any type of quarterback. I guess we give him some credit for Mahomes, but I think we're going to give Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid a lot of that credit. Uh, quite frankly, I would rather them fire Nagy and Pace and put Andy Dalton in charge of this team and have them try to move Justin Fields along here because I think they know more than what Nagy does. Uh, that was disgraceful what he threw out there uh, on the weekend. So, uh, you know, he said Fields wasn't ready. That's about the only kind thing I can say. He warned you, uh, but uh, his game planning for this is just brutal and atrocious. And if I was the Bears, I would not let him anywhere near my first round quarterback to try to mold him into some sort of NFL quarterback. Uh, really just disgraceful the way uh, they came out in that game. Now, not to, you know, throw any shade at your praise of Nagy, but I, I may have uh, something to counter that uh, point you made about Nagy uh, later on in the show. All right. Uh, we'll move on. We already went over the Saints and New England game. You had the under in this game. It went under. I would pretty much take all unders in New England games uh, until they start throwing them under the 30, uh, which at some point they might uh, from what we've seen from the offense. Uh, but as long as they stay in the 40s, I pretty much ride those as much as I could. Uh, we talked about the Giants and the Falcons game. You lost that one. We talked about the Steelers and the Natty game. We You lost that one. We talked Philly plus four versus Dallas. You lost that one. And then the last one we'll get into, the Seattle Seahawks, minus one and a half versus the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, this really wasn't all that great a game. Seattle uh, sort of continued their second half uh, from the Tennessee Titans game and uh, did not look very good in this one. Vikings won it pretty easy, 30-17. Uh, I'm curious, uh, more worried about Seattle or I think Minnesota's sort of finding themselves here? No, I'm more worried about Seattle. Uh, this was one of those teams that I kind of uh, had a feeling would be competitive as they had been pretty much every single season over the last five, seven years, or at least since Wilson's been there. Uh, but this was Russell Wilson's first career loss versus the Vikings. Um, you know, on the other side of the ball for the Vikings, uh, when I heard that Cook wasn't playing, I was like, okay, this is going to be an easy win for Seattle. Um, but you have Alexander Madison who came in in relief of Cook he ran for 112 yards, which is a uh, tighter career high, which he actually ran against Seattle also. Um, 2020, I think it was, uh, he also ran for 112 yards versus Seattle. So um, a little bit of a trend there. Uh, Kirk Cousins has over 70% completion percentage, uh, eight plus pass touchdowns and zero interceptions. So he, it looks like he's starting to pick up his game a little bit. Um, you know, and young receiver Jefferson, fastest Vikings player to reach 100 plus receptions. So, you know, they have a lot of good things going forward, but I think the main storyline here is the Seattle Seahawks, a team that a lot of us predict to be a dark horse and a contender in the NFC West, a really tough division. Um, and they just don't seem to be playing up to that standard right now. I don't know if this uh, is something that we can expect going forward or this is just um, a little bit of that, you know, you don't know what Seattle team is going to play. Uh, we saw it a little bit last season where they had absolutely no defense, um, and that offense was super explosive. And then they flipped, they flipped uh, scripts, and that defense was killer uh, towards the second half of the season. And that offense kind of slowed down a bit. 
So I, I don't know what you think, but I think it's more concerning for the Seahawks. Oh, yeah. I, I'm way concerned about this Seahawks team because I, I don't even know what side of the ball to pick on here. I, I don't think the offense looks all that great uh, right now, and, and I don't think the defense looks all that great right now. It's really just they have seem to have lost all balance and semblance of, you know, a team here now. They did look good in week one. They looked good for the whole first half of that Titans game. But since that second half has started, uh, this is sort of more of the same that we saw towards the end of last year uh, going into the playoffs from the Seattle team. It, it's just really, really concerning. Uh, Vikings played a really good game here. I, I won't say the best game of their season. I, I thought they played really well in that Arizona game. They just did what uh, Vikings teams in have done and found ways to lose it. They didn't find ways to lose this one. Uh, you mentioned Alexander Madison. Really nice to have him as a backup. Uh, went in there and uh, really uh, did a job for them. Uh, I, I did sort of like this game. I wanted to take Minnesota, but then uh, when Cook got ruled out, it, it sort of scared me off. But uh, it, it just, I, I'm not in love with this Seattle team. Interesting game coming up this weekend versus the Niners. We'll get to that on Friday's show. But uh, I'm really, really curious how this Seahawks team sort of bounces back because, you know, we mentioned it in our preview series. Uh, the schedule is not going to get easier for Seattle. And, you know, these kind of games versus Minnesota are ones they're going to have to win because they're going to uh, San Francisco next week. San Francisco can't really afford to lose that game after what we got in the Green Bay game. We'll get to that one in a second. And then, you know, they still have to play the Rams twice. They still have to play the Cardinals twice. You know, it's just really uh, – I'm concerned about the Seahawks here. And uh, – I'm a little bit concerned about Russell Wilson too. You know, we, we saw a little bit of it in that second half last year where he wasn't playing all that great. And, uh, you know, I, I haven't thought he's played excellent so far to start this year as well. Yeah. I mean, and I think it's kind of a, a recurring theme with a lot of these teams uh, like the Steelers and the Patriots. And um, we're so used to these teams being great um, that we're kind of, bankrolling them off of that. Um, we're used to Seattle teams being great. And because of that, we are expecting great things from this team, even though it's not the same team. Now you look at the standings, they're one and two now. You have uh, the the Rams and the Cardinals both sitting at 3-0. and uh, Both of them are playing against each other this upcoming week. So one of those two teams is going to be 4-0. and The other one's going to be 3-1. and um, So Seattle can't really afford another loss, especially against a tough divisional rival in the 49ers. Um, so next week's going to be really important for them. I think it's going to be interesting. Obviously, we'll get into it on Friday, but um, it's, it's this upcoming week's going to be really important just based off the slow start from Seattle. Yeah, definitely so. All right, we'll move in the game that we had no action on. The Indianapolis Colts went to the Tennessee Titans. Uh, Carson Wentz did play in this game, but, uh, you know, it, it's sort of more the same for the Colts right now. They're 0-3. They seem just good enough to play these games tight, but they don't seem good enough right now to win football games. Uh, Tennessee looked, you know, sort of hot and cold. Uh, Brown got hurt. Julio Jones didn't play in that second half. I don't know what you make uh, of this game other than I think the AFC South is really, really bad. I, you know, I, I think Tennessee has a clear way to win this unless the Colts get healthy, but uh I'm not sure I trust any team in this division unless Tyrod Taylor makes a miracle recovery. Cause I think the best thing I've seen so far is the Houston Texans for one and a half games when Tyrod was healthy. Yeah. I, I mean, you pretty much hit the nail on the head at this, this division, although we've kind of expected it to be either an offensive powerhouse or a defensive powerhouse based off the way the Colts played last season. We haven't seen much of either. Um, now the Colts have been seen okay. off. Yeah. <laughs> The Colts have been they haven't been horrible on offense. They just haven't been as good on defense as we expected. I think the Colts' biggest issue right now is the fact that 80, 90% of their offense is generated through their running backs. And as of right now, it hasn't been all that great. Uh, for Tennessee's side of the ball, defensively, they looked a little bit better this week, but again, this was against uh, you know, a, a hurt quarterback who a lot of us assumed was probably going to be out. Um, and as I mentioned, a team that their main weapons on offense are, are the running backs. So um, still not too excited about that Tennessee defense. 
Now you have the injuries on the offense side of the ball, which are a little concerning. Uh, but I do think the positive side here is Derrick Henry. Um, you know, through three games, he's tallied up 353 rushing yards, uh, which ties the most for, you know, three games of uh, through the first three games of the season for him. Um, they're 20 and 0, the times are when Henry has over 24 touches. Uh, so I think this probably opens up the possibility for them to become a more run oriented team, which is realistically when they're better. Uh, it's when they rely on Derrick Henry. And, you know, we mentioned a little bit during the offseason, it is it possible that he's lost a step? Um, it's possible, but he looks good so far. Uh, and if he keeps playing this way, then I think the times are going to be dangerous offensively. Uh, but again, balance on offense is so important for this team just because of how poor that defense plays. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, you know, uh, we'll go to our next game. I think this was probably the most entertaining game on the day, the uh, Chargers and the Chiefs. Uh, Chargers come away with a win in Arrowhead, 30-24. You know, sort of more the same from the Chiefs. uh, But uh, I I think this is the poorest I've sort of seen Patrick Mahomes play. Uh, you know, I, I thought the defense for the Chiefs actually played a little bit better than they had, uh, but this is the first time where I've seen that Chiefs offense sort of turn the ball over. Uh, teams seem to be really, really uh, making the Chiefs sort of go dink and dunk the whole way through uh, playing real, I mean, there's two deep coverage and then they're playing two deep, deep coverage where they just aren't going to let uh, Tyree kill uh, sort of expose them. Uh, so I, I thought the chiefs had a good defensive game plan forced those turnovers offensively. They look really, really good. Uh, if they could find a way to sort of uh, knock out uh, bad penalties in situations where they score offensive touchdowns or hit huge plays, they'd probably be even better. But uh, I I think that's just ingrained into Chargers DNA from, I don't know, since the start of time, apparently. Uh, But what did you make of this game? Uh, You know, I thought there was a lot of positives to look, especially on the uh, Chargers side of the ball. You know, you look, you go back to last season and uh, 14 of 18 uh, starts, have been decided by one possession for the Chargers. Um, we saw it a lot last season where they were in games, but as you said, silly mistakes with penalties uh, caused them so many different games. They would be a completely different team if it weren't for those penalties. A lot of this has to do with the fact that they're a very young team. Uh, so, th- you know, there's still the possibility of being able to grow out of that. Uh, Kansas City has lost two straight games for the first time since week five and six of 2019. Uh, you know, Patrick Mahomes, his third quarter reception was, uh, believe his, uh, his, no, sorry, his fourth quarter reception was his third interception over the last uh, couple of games. So a little bit of concern there. Uh, we mentioned it, you know, in our previous show that the Chiefs, or at least I brought it up, that the Chiefs, although they're a great team, they have a lot of really good players. They are kind of Cardinal-esque in the sense that, they've made so many beautiful plays happen. So many great plays happen, you know, that are very uh, flashy that they've become dependent on these plays. And when they don't work out, you have scenarios like this where they lose tight games. Um, I go to that interception he threw them homes through when he was looking off to the right and he kind of did a no look pass and it went straight to the hands of the tight end, but they bounced off his hands and it turned into a turnover. Um, Little, little things like that that accumulate in a game and you have this type of outcome. I think that um, I wouldn't be too concerned if I was the Chiefs, but defensively uh, I would be concerned uh, because even though they looked a little bit better, they, they haven't looked good. And if you go up against a powerhouse offense, uh, you're probably going to have these type of games. So I'd definitely be a little concerned. Yeah, uh, you answered sort of the main question I was going to ask you. How much concern do you have for these Chiefs? Uh, It's been, you know, mainstream media's number one, are the Chiefs done? They aren't winning the division right now, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm not all that concerned about the Chiefs right now. You know, uh, it it took a Ravens, a, a minor miracle to win that game. And then this game, the Chargers were so scared to give Patrick Mahomes the ball back. They basically went for it on a fourth and nine instead of kicking a field goal uh, to win the game. And then they basically tried to run out the clock to zero uh, before scoring a touchdown. They didn't quite do that. They did get the interception off Mahomes when he tried to win it back. But, you know, 
I, I do think the Chiefs are a little bit weaker than they've been. I, I think it's interesting that they are bringing in Josh Gordon uh, to try to fill probably that Sammy Watkins role. Uh, whether he can stay uh, healthy is probably not the right word, but uh, clean and get through a year uh, would be, you know, interesting to see. And, and for that matter, he hasn't played <laughs> in so long. I don't even know if he's still a good receiver, but uh, you know, it, it's interesting to see if they can fill that void. I, I'm not too, too worried about the chiefs, but I'm curious if you are. Yeah. I, like I said, I'm not too worried. I'm more worried defensively because defensively they've given up so many points um, this season and even going to last season, you know, if the offense can't keep up, that defense has a really hard time of, uh, you know, containing the opposing offense enough to where they're in games. But I will say this, this Josh Gordon signing, you know, I don't think it's going to be an impact type of signing, especially not right off the bat. I think that maybe, uh, you know, as we get closer to the playoffs and uh, you start getting into the elimination type of uh, weeks, I think that's when he might actually make an impact. How much of an impact? I don't know. But, you know, whenever you bring a guy that at some point was talented, um, if if he has that type of talent still, um, it's helpful. But, again, we haven't seen him play in such a long time that it's really hard to assume that he's going to be an impact player. Yeah, definitely. So, all right, uh, Miami, Las Vegas. Uh, the one thing Las Vegas uh, seems to be able to do is uh, play entertaining football games. Uh, they beat Miami 31-28. Uh, interesting game here because – I, I really don't know how the Dolphins stayed in this game. Uh, they made a nice little comeback in the end, uh, but I was watching a lot of this game on the second TV uh, as I had the Rams on the first one, and I, I was sort of not paying a ton of attention to it. And then all of a sudden I was like, how are the Dolphins in this game? Every time I look at it, uh, Las Vegas is gaining tons of yards. Peyton Barber ran for 100 yards. Uh, Derek Carr threw for almost 400 yards. Yet it was a three-point game in overtime. But uh, what did you make of this game here? Now I will say this. The Raiders, Las Vegas Raiders, are actually starting to grow on me. I'm starting to kind of switch to the believer side of the, of the spectrum here. Um, I will say this. There, um, there are three wins this season – are all against opponents that had at least 10 wins the prior season. Now, you take that as you will. I understand that there's injuries and all these things that come into play. Uh, but that Dolphins defense, we've stated it before, there are no pushovers. Uh, we saw it in that Bills game that they got killed. They were keeping it close for as long as they could. It's just that the offense couldn't really get going. Um, you know, the Raiders have a massive total of uh, 1,413 yards so far this season through three weeks, which is the most in team history. Um, the Raiders, this is their first 3-0 start since – 2002, I think, when they lost in the Super Bowl. Uh, not saying they're going to make the Super Bowl, but, you know, that's just a little, a little stat to keep in mind here. Uh, and Jalen Waddle, uh, this was a little, a little crazy when I was looking at this. He had 12 receptions, I believe, uh, for 58 yards. I believe this was the fewest receptions uh, by somebody who had over 10 receptions in a game uh, in like 20 years or something like that. I can't remember the actual numbers, but – um, entertaining game, uh, and kudos to the Dolphins for keeping it entertaining because I'm sure a lot of people didn't expect them to be in this game, especially with all the injuries they've been they've been uh, uh, dealing with. Yeah, definitely so. Uh, you know, it, it seems like this might be a year where Miami last year uh, was in a lot of tight, close games, and they seem to find ways to win it. It, it might be the year where they're in a lot of tight, close games and uh, might find ways to lose it. So it, it'll be interesting to see how they go. Uh, Tua went on the IR, so we're going to get a lot of Jacoby Bursett uh, for the next couple of weeks. I, I don't know how much of a, you know, uh, downgrade that is, but we'll, uh, you know, sort of see how Miami, if they can sort of find their way to win a couple of these games. But uh, Las Vegas uh, continues their streak and uh, continues to play entertaining games. Uh, they might make it on TV too, a little bit more often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're def I know they're definitely making it on uh, Red Zone channel for me, so... All right, uh, we'll move on to the last game of the weekend. Another entertaining, great Sunday night football game. Green Bay Packers versus the San Francisco 49ers. And the only thing you can say about this one is do not give Aaron Rodgers time. And uh, maybe, 
maybe not single cover Devontae Adams in the middle of the field if you give Aaron Rodgers time, but uh, an entertaining uh, game nonetheless. Uh, I, I don't really come away from uh, this game looking bad upon either of these teams. I, I think these are the two, two of the top teams in the NFC side of things for sure here. Yeah, I mean, the way this game was going at first, it seemed like Green Bay was going to possibly run away with this game. You know, Aaron Rodgers has always had uh, at least a connection to the Bay Area. Um, and even prior to the season starting, there were rumors of a potential Aaron Rodgers trade um, with him landing in, in, I guess, San Francisco or Santa Clarita, whatever you want to call it. Um, now, with all that being said, you know, none of that came into fruition. And you have both these teams, which – prior to the season started, were considered to be powerhouse teams. Um, the Packers obviously didn't open up the season the way we all expected them to, but it seems like they're starting to get back into their mojo. Uh, Aaron Rodgers looked good, especially early on in this game. Um, and the 49ers, although they were getting pretty much handled the first half, they made a game of it. And this is just kind of the recipe the Niners have had so far this season. Either they start off hot and kind of dwindle down as, as the game goes, or they start off cold and then get hot uh, towards the second half. So I, I don't know if this is concerning for Niner fans, but to me, the way I look at it is you went up against a really good team, the reigning, you know, offensive player of the year, um, and you held your own. Uh, so especially, you know, in the game you were down. So I, I'm not going to take too much away from San Francisco for this loss. Um, I'm not going to add too much for Green Bay in this win. Uh, I thought both teams showed up. I thought it was a pretty entertaining game and uh, you know, uh, we'll go forward from here, but I think yeah. it was a good performance. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, you know, I, I thought Green Bay's defense played much, much better than it has in the first two weeks of the season. Uh, they were able to get some more pressure on the quarterback than they had been, being able to force some turnovers and, uh, you know, uh, didn't just get totally gashed on the run. Uh, that would be the only thing I, I'd say negative about San Francisco. You know, I, I talked about Trey Sermon in the preseason. I talked about him in our draft show. I was really, really excited for him to go to the San Francisco team. And uh, personally, I just thought he looked bad in this game. And uh, it, it's really hard to look bad for the San Francisco 49ers as a running back. Uh, you know, so you sort of see why he was a healthy scratch in that week one game. He, he just doesn't seem to have found his mojo or playing style in this offense. So it'll be interesting to see uh, if uh, a couple of these uh, running backs get healthy for the Niners and if they can sort of refine that running game. Uh, they also brought in another guy, uh, a Cincinnati Bengals cast off. Uh, I, I don't know if that's quite the answer, but uh, anyway, uh, I, I thought the Niners really played well in that second half. Uh, you know, if the fullback goes down on the one and they run it in with no time left, they're the winners. And we're probably asking questions about Green Bay. But uh, nonetheless, they uh, left a little bit too much time on the clock and uh, Green Bay comes away with a nice win there. I think we can all uh, chill out a little bit after the uh, week one no show. Yeah, definitely. All right. So that wraps us up for our reviews of the week. Now let's get into our best and worst of the week. On the offensive side of things, where are you going for best of the week this week for us, Achilles? Okay, so for best of the week on offense, I'm taking a little bit of an unusual path as I normally do. Um, this time I'm going to add two guys to this list, uh, and they're both on special teams. I'm taking Just Tucker for his record setting field goal, and I'm taking uh, Jamal Agnew for his 109-yard uh, uh return touchdown, uh, which tied for the longest uh, play in NFL history. So I thought that even though they're all special teams, I thought both guys uh, made offensive plays, and I thought they deserved to be mentioned here. Yeah, definitely so. So uh, I'm going with Alexander Madison as my offensive player of the week. Uh, he got the late call to come in there and uh, be the running back for the Minnesota Vikings. And, and I really thought he answered the bell and uh, played a great, great football game and got Minnesota on the board with their first win of the season. Uh, so I'm going with Alexander Madison as my offensive player of the week. Where are you going on the defensive side of things? Uh, for defense side of the week, I think it's no surprise here. Uh, I think most everybody in America has this as their best player of the week. Miles Garrett, uh, you know, from uh, Cleveland. Uh, I thought he had a great performance. He was basically all over the field. And the entire Browns unit as a whole, uh, as a matter of fact, on my notes, I had him as the monsters of the Brown way uh, because they sacked Justin Fields nine times in that game. Uh, so it seems like they all feasted. But 
Uh, I think the star of the show was definitely Miles Garrett, so I thought I'd mention him. Yeah, uh, we're on the same wavelength here. I, I don't think there was much uh, less of a way to go. So uh, I am going with Brandon, St- Brandon Staley. I think I just gave away my coach of the week. I'm going with Miles Garrett as well. Where are you going for your coach of the week? I think we know where I'm going with mine. <laughs> well, for coach of the week, I'm going with Zach Taylor, the Bengals coach. Uh, you know, they gave up uh, – no sacks to a Steelers defense, which a lot of us believe uh, was probably the best defense in football. Now, I understand that they've had injuries, but I said it prior to the game last week that I thought even without Watt, they could put together the type of game plan to really kind of fluster this young quarterback, uh, a team that a lot of us didn't really have high hopes for uh, in the beginning of the season. But he put together a good protection scheme. Uh, put together a good game plan to kind of get the ball out of the quarterback's hand or hand it off to the running back uh, at, at a good with good timing. And it was enough to make it so that they didn't go up any sacks. So uh, I, and they got the win, which is more important, the divisional win against uh, a powerhouse team or powerhouse team. Uh, I thought he deserved the nod this week. So Zach Taylor, uh, coach of the week. Yeah, I'm going with Brandon Staley as my uh, coach of the week. Uh, really uh, thought that uh, fourth and nine call to uh, uh, in the game there to win him the game uh, and, and keep the ball out of Patrick Mahomes' hands uh, was a gutsy call and a smart call for that matter because uh, you knew exactly what was going to happen if you punted the ball back to the Chiefs there or tried some long field goal and missed it there or even for that matter if you made the long field goal. Uh, so really liked the, the game plan Brandon Staley came in, uh, it, you know, sort of makes up for uh, last week's uh, debacle versus the Dallas Cowboys uh, where they should have had that win. Really, the uh, Chargers should be 3-0 and right now. Uh, they are 2-1, and one, but I think they've looked really, really good uh, so far. So Brandon Staley, my coach of the week. All right, worst of the week. Where are you going on the offensive side of things here? Well, for worst of the week on offense, uh, I thought I'd give the award to two different guys, even though I don't think it completely falls on them. I thought that they, the performance – uh, earned them the award this week. Uh, and that's going to be two quarterbacks, Zach Taylor and Justin Fields. I thought that both quarterbacks, professional quarterbacks, mind you, uh, didn't really show up. They, they didn't put up the type of numbers that uh, I think some people expect them to put up. And so far they've underwhelmed this season. And I understand it's not all on them. They don't have the weapons and, you know, coaching calls and all these different factors that come into play. But I, I just thought that for mentioning the particular players in general, I thought these two guys were deserving this week as worst of the week. So Taylor and Fields, worst of the week. Yeah, we're going uh, on the same uh, wavelength here. I'm going with the rookie quarterback trifecta here in uh, Zach Wilson, uh, Justin Fields, and uh, Trevor Lawrence. Uh, it's it, some of that is a cumulative award for the first three weeks of the season, but uh, overall, they were all really uh, pretty bad uh, that week. I-, I thought Trevor actually was uh, better than he had been the first two weeks, so I, I saw a little bit of growth there. But uh, overall, rookie quarterback contingent, uh, my worst on the offensive side of things uh, uh, this week. All right, where are you going on the defensive side of things? On defense, as usual, I'm going with an entire unit, and this is the Steelers defensive unit. Uh, Again, as I said last week, I thought that they could at least get enough pressure on this young team to cause some havoc, but they accumulated zero sacks. And that was the first time in 76 games that the Steelers have gone an entire game without receiving a sack. So I thought for that type of performance and that type of record, Steelers, worst of the week. All right. uh, I'm going with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers as the worst of the week and really uh, Speaking of cumulative, it's just been three weeks of really, really bad defense. And I wanted to single out Devin White, who really was a catalyst for their great uh, push at the end of last season uh, and towards the Super Bowl. Has really, really been bad this year. Has not been good. Was terrible in this game versus the uh, Los Angeles Rams. Uh, so Tampa Bay Bucks, Devin White are my worst of the week on the defensive side of things. Where are you going for the coaching side of things? Okay, now, as I kind of gave you a little sneak peek earlier on, uh, for my worst head coach of the week, I'm going with Matt Nagy of the Bears, okay? And this is where I make an argument to your positive remark towards Matt Nagy. Uh, (laughs) I like how you frame it as a positive remark. (laughs) Well, because you're right. He did say he thought Justin Fields wasn't ready, and it appears he's not ready. But I also go back to midweek after Dalton got hurt. They asked him, is Dalton still the quarterback of this team? Is he still a starting quarterback? And all he did was grin 
during that press conference. He, he had a big grin on his face, and he said, I'm, I'm not getting into that right now. Um, later on, the PR team had to come out and, and release a statement saying, you know, Dalton is our starting, our starting quarterback if he's healthy. Uh, you know, with all that being said, you know, they rushed, they had 10 rushes for 34 yards. You know, uh, they have weapons on offense. net passing yard 68 total passing yards i think that a lot of that has to do with the you know the scheme that the uh, coach put together so i thought he was definitely deserving this week you don't put a young quarterback back there with no blocking scheme you don't put him out there with that type of game plan uh, and basically set him up to fail so matt nagy worst of the week for coach yeah uh he's just uh on my worst of the week uh all time uh <laughs> you can pretty much guarantee he's the worst of the week every time he hits the sideline so i'm going to go a little bit uh deeper and uh not pick on his uh terrible butt who should be fired uh probably uh four years ago when they hired him. Uh, anyway, with that, Ryan Pace should be out of there too. Uh, it's not just him. It's the GM as well. Uh, but anyway, I'm going with Pete Carroll. Uh, you know, right now, uh, this Seahawks team seems a little bit lost. And uh, they were looking a little bit lost at the end of last year. Uh, they kind of righted the ship the last three or four games. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it just – I thought that Vikings game, they looked really, really poor. They didn't know what they wanted to do offensively. They didn't know what they wanted to do defensively. And uh, it's just not looking like a great team right now. And they could drop in a hurry in that NFC West division if they aren't careful here. It's going to be really hard for them to climb out of the hole. I know they've done that in years past where they've gotten, you know, off to slow starts and climbed out of the hole and found a way in the playoffs. I don't think they will be able to do that this year uh, with the teams that are in that uh, side of their division. So uh, Pete Carroll is my worst of the week uh, this week. That's a really good call. All right. We're going to preview the Thursday night football game. And let me tell you, they gave us a winner this week. People will be tuned in across the country as the Jacksonville Jaguars <laughs> make the great trip up to Cincinnati to play the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, I, I don't quite know how to preview this one other than two bad teams will be playing football on Thursday night. Uh, you are really really into football if you want to stare at this thing uh, from kickoff uh, till the final whistle. Uh, somehow the Bengals are seven and a half point favorites in a game. <laughs> it's because of the, it's because they beat the Steelers. That's what really changed know. their life. Yes, they did. Um, how anyone is going to be willing to take the Bengals as over a touchdown favorite in a game? I don't know. But uh, what do you make of this one? I think there's going to be a good test with two young quarterbacks. Uh, you're going up against opposing teams that are beatable. Uh, both the uh, the Jaguars and the Bengals are beatable uh, on defense. Um, so I think this is going to be more of a measuring stick to where these young quarterbacks are at. Now, obviously, you have Burrow, who's uh, a, a year the veteran here, but he also missed a good chunk of last season with that injury. And then you have the young, hot, you know, first-round pick uh, with the new, you know, hot – I wouldn't to say hot, but the, uh, the head coach uh, who's coming in to change the game, so to speak um, – so I, I think it's going to be a good barometer as far as where both these teams stand. Uh, I, I don't think we can expect too much craziness. I don't understand the spread in particular. Uh, I, I think the Steelers game has a lot to do with it. But, again, I think there's going to be a good measuring stick to where we can expect these teams to go uh, going forward. Yeah. Uh, I, I will say, if you watch Winning Daily on Thursday, there might be some money writing on the Jags breaking their 19 game losing streak in this one. So uh, stay tuned for winning daily. Be sure to like and subscribe. So you don't miss said winning daily for that hot pick of possibly the Jacksonville Jaguars on the money line plus 280. Achilles, where can we find you? <laughs> As always, you can find me on Twitter at TD Achilles. All right. That's our show. And we're out. 